Hi, everybody, and welcome to week nine of ABCD Reaper NIM. We're very excited to uh, be with you this week and talk about the next phase of our lectures. We're going to have Christina Yubin here today. She's going to talk to us about ABCD biospecimens. Um, and then we also have our own Sasha Ghosh, who's going to talk to us about reproducible workflows and analyses. Christina, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Christina Eubin. I'm at the University of California, Irvine, and I've been involved with ABCD since its inception as a postdoc and had the honor to write some of the biospecimen pieces and be on the work groups early on. And I now have my own laboratory, Developing Brains Laboratory at UCI. Uh, one of my PhD students, Minhaz uh, Mosin, is here and um, we work with uh, salivary biomarkers and biospecimens and um, also with prenatal factors. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, Satra, do you want to say hi? Hi, uh, my name is Satra. I'm at MIT at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research and also at Harvard Medical School. I just wanted to say my group focuses on the development of technologies for reproducible research and the application of various technologies to mental illnesses. We use brain imaging, machine learning, and scalable technologies like smartphones and wearables. We have a specific focus on understanding the neural basis of human communication and using how we speak and what we speak as proxies for assessing and tracking mental health. Uh, Part of my role here through Reprenim is that we have been part of many informatics efforts, including NiPy, BIDS, NIDM, uh, and we are also running two brain initiative projects, uh, Dandy, a cellular neurophysiology data archive, and No Brain, a deep learning framework for neuroimaging. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the Q&A. I want to make a couple of announcements first. Please, everybody, our, our very repetitive weekly announcement, go ahead and submit your project week proposals. We are really excited about some of the uh, great proposals that have been submitted so far. We want you to encourage you to go ahead and keep submitting those. Um, we invite you to use the lectures to really think hard about what kind of project you wanna work on. Project proposals are not required, they are encouraged, but you can always participate on projects that are submitted by someone else. But if you see something that you like, feel free to go onto GitHub and um, give comments and feedback so that we can see those proposals get further developed. Uh, the deadline to submit your project proposal is February 12th, which is two weeks before our last course session. Uh, in addition, for our enrolled students, we want you to go ahead and complete the ABCD data access and duck status survey that's in Canvas. Um, so far, we have 23 students who have indicated that yes, they have uh, access to ABCD data, a couple of you are pending, but for the vast majority of you, we have not heard yet. So please go ahead and let us know um, what's going on. If you're a uh, uh, duck has been approved, remember to complete the confirmation survey as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dave Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, and again, I don't have too much to say other than welcome you all yet again to uh, week eight. As I'm about to introduce you know, today's uh, lead TA, I do want to just take this opportunity to thank all of our stellar TAs. They do such a huge amount of work. Uh, and yes, you get to see some of them each week, you know, either in their you know, sessions or on this Zoom. But uh, as I you know, now introduce James Kent for today, I just wanted to say that about all of them. But Welcome aboard again, James. Say hello. And I'm, you're rocking the wrong shirt today, I see. Is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, well, hi. Thank you for the thank you. Um, and I just want to say thank you for letting me be a part of this. And this has been an awesome experience for me and really fits in with what I'm interested in to help out with uh, ABCD and uh, helping out with reproducible analysis. So I'm a postdoc at the University of Austin, Texas. and some of you may have already seen me from last session. Uh, so I will get started with the Q&A unless if Jessica Although, has anything uh, else to add. Yeah, I think there's a Jessica introduction. Yeah, sure. yeah I don't actually have uh, many announcements for this week other than just um, uh, repeating the call that Angie uh, put out of uh, putting in your project ideas if uh, you have ideas for project week, even if they're not that fully fleshed out. Um, and uh, I think we'll have more announcements about Project Week coming up soon. That's all I got for announcements this week. Okay. So back to you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for Christina and Satra for uh, talking with us today and coming. 
Uh, I'm going to get started with a question for Christina. Um, so question here says, for biospecimen data, is it better to be stringent or lenient when developing your decision tree to determine which samples will be excluded due to methodological considerations? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so when uh, the way that we collect saliva specifically for the purpose of looking at gonadal hormone levels in ABCD, it really can vary by the time of day um, at, at which each of the 21 sites is collecting it. Um, also, when the participant stops uh, spitting actively in the tube can vary. So we have a start and stop time. So that can vary a little bit. Um, and there's also other methodological considerations. So when you look at the tube, both the RA collecting it as well as on the end of assaying it at Salometrics, they make notes, you know, does it look cloudy? Does it look colored? Can be indicator that the mouth wasn't fully clean. If there's blood, those things can interfere with our ability to assay and get an accurate hormone level. So there's tons of different sources of methodological considerations um, when you're using salivary data for hormones and so you have basically a really big decision are you really lenient and just kind of accept anyone who sampled at any time of day or maybe accept some of the samples that had discoloration but their hormone value looks okay and you know the unpleasing um, answer is it really just depends if you're narrowing in on twins with a specific genetic you know phenotype you might want to be more lenient and just report that you are and then maybe do a secondary analysis where you are more stringent in those criteria and just replicate that what you found wasn't influenced by your decision to um, be really lenient and be allow a little bit messier methods into your biospecimen analyses or if you're really stringent we also have the the, the practical um, situation where maybe there's some kind of sample bias. Is there something different about those kids in ABCD coming in and sampling in the morning than the ones sampling in the evening? Or is there is it a specific site that's sampling a specific time and you want that time to control for a circadian pattern? And now you just collected, you just analyzed everyone in Florida and excluded everyone in LA for whatever reason, right? So I think reproducing your own results by changing those methodological, you know, restrictions or decisions and showing that you find the same thing is a very powerful practice that you could include in the same publication, or at the very least, just report your decision tree of what you did and include it in the publication <laughs> somewhere, register your variables that you used. And, um, and I think that there's power in that converging evidence and someone does it differently than you and you find different things method methodological decisions and that noise from difference in methods around biospecimen collection could have been the reason why you're finding different things so just be transparent and report and record all of these things and i think that's a really important point to make um i want to kind of jump in here for a second just because you know with with this whole course we've had ver two very independent streams of lectures we have our abcd and our reprenim and this week it felt like there was a very nice intersection with respect to that specific point so i kind of want to say satra do you want to maybe follow up on that and and sort of reemphasize that point from your perspective I think Christina answered it really well. So this comes up in the context of, I think, uh, some of the questions that may have come up, which is really about how can I reduce the bottlenecks in my research process? And if you think of all the decision-making that goes on in any research process, some of them are decisions about computational tools, but a lot of them are decisions at the experimental stage. Uh, and as Christina said, a key element, at least as we still figure out which of these steps are reproducible, which of these steps introduce variants, is to annotate that decision tree and the process that you have taken. Uh, so I 100% agree with kind of that notion that at least at that data collection or design stage, please annotate. Uh, because you may have done things based on either lab practices that you're used to, which nobody else will know outside that lab. And it's important to describe what those are for somebody else to reproduce it. That's awesome. Thank you both for uh, weighing in on that. I think there might be another question that's very related. So I'll see, um, I'll read it and see if there's anything else that you, either of you would like to add. Um, so it reads, Dr. Urban spoke about the many, many decision ones has to make about quality control when working with ABC. The biospecimen data. 
Dr. Ghosh talked about the importance of reducing bottlenecks often caused by the need for human interaction with the data. These two seem equally important, but a bit at odds with each other. I'm not really sure how to turn the main decisions I have to make about data and analysis into an automated data flow. A lot of these decisions seem to rely on human interaction. So um, which one of you would like to take it first or would you like me to call on? I could start with it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yes, it's at odds because one says, how do I automate? But you're not alone. Uh, even for many of us who ha may have been doing neuroimaging for a long, long time, we don't always know why we take certain decisions. Uh, we are still exploring. And the other thing that complicates matters is that the data collection, the instruments are changing. So we have to understand the new data, the new sources of variance that are created to better understand what quality should be. Uh, and so quality control, uh, it's very easy to come up with quality metrics. It's much harder to decide how to use those metrics. So this is something that the field as a whole is still working towards. We won't have solid answers yet till we understand what those metrics do in terms of various applications. And it could be that one measure of quality is bad for a certain use case, but that same measure might be okay for another use case. So it becomes very application or intent dependent in various ways. And this is where I believe if we can come together and express our decisions in annotated form, we will all move forward with knowing what decisions are being taken. That was, I echo everything that Satra had mentioned. The one thing I would add is that, you know, as many of us that are on these, you know, quality checking committees in ABCD, looking at the data and trying to say, well, why would we put out data that we would, would exclude in our own analyses, right? We would all unanimously agree that we would exclude this during a quality checking process, and we would not include this marker for, for a number of reasons. But we're, why, why are we still putting it out there for publicly available data? And I'm talking specifically about physiological biomarker data, um, the physical health metrics in ABCD. And we basically decided, you know, if it's missing or it's clearly biologically, physiologically impossible for a human to express that data point, we'll either remove it as an NA and have that site, have their team re-ask that, or if, if it's able to recover it, and then we'll put it out in the next release. Um, or we'll take it out. But if there's a gray area, which most of them that I would exclude or possibly include have a gray area, and we really want each person to have that level of decision. And because and, and we don't know how that will impact what you find, or if that someone else independently would make a different decision. So what we're doing, um, a paper that Megan Herding and I are co first authoring on behalf of all ABCD for the physical pubertal metrics, and how they correspond for the salivary gonadal hormone hormone levels. So how do your hormone levels correspond to your outward physical maturation that's out in press uh, like this afternoon, um, January 29th, 2021. And for that, um, you know, we're publishing all of our scripts. So if you have someone in your group that's using R, you can just quality check it with how we did it and not make those decisions um, by just running the scripts, right? And so we're still giving you as ABCD, we're still giving you all the data with the gray area to make your own decision. But we're also hopefully as people keep publishing, they'll upload their scripts on GitHub so that we can bypass all of that and just use your decision if we really follow what you did and how you described it. Can I just throw a little bit of an additional comment in there just as a analogy that uh, again we've seen you know big data sets you know prior to this you know like uh, the uh, abide you know data set well yeah there's 1100 images there but there's probably only about 800 or so that have you know good you know qa but then that 800 you know is very different and so most of the pu publications you see use about 800 but exactly which 800 they you know chose as being plus or minus you know is very variable so again it's not that it's a problem to do that but the main issue is to annotate how and why and at least what you chose in the end. So again, that's gonna come up over and over and over again, exactly what you choose will depend and that's fine, but you know, publish what and the best you can about why. And then that will work itself out hopefully in the long run.
And I would encourage people to also, as you put your own publications out there, I would encourage you to join us in the whole script sharing kind of culture that that this developmental neuroimaging has really kind of started. And you know, my scripting is really rudimentary. My 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 PhD students Minhaz and Hawa and Vita here, they you know, you know, we're all you know still beginner scripters. They're not super elegant, and you get kind of self conscious sometimes putting your scripts out there it's not that you don't want to share it's just it's like you're piecemealing things and where you could be a little bit more um uh succinct in your scripting it's okay you know and and then maybe someone will reach out and say hey i found this new you know line of code with your script that just bypasses all that for you i mean it's it, it opens up if you put yourself out there in a vulnerable way and script share it will it will pay it will it will reward you so just please join me in that um endeavor i think a lot of us are really motivated to do that and I know it's scary at first, but just put it out there on GitHub. We'll all benefit. Now I'd like to echo that last sentiment. I think that the what's really surprised me is just how kind the community is when I've started sharing things. And that's really helped improve my own coding ability is by putting stuff out there and by uh, getting feedback from others. And sometimes you really have to solicit that feedback. And another thing is that people think once they put something on GitHub, everyone's going to see it and then have opinions on it. Um, but the the reality is, is that most people don't look. <laughs> so even if it's just for you, uh, using GitHub as a public tracking for the code that you write just for yourself is a is a good practice. OK, so I think that there's one more that kind of follows along the, the line of decision making. Uh, that is also for both of you. Um, it says the biospecimen talk brought up the important point that there are inevitable errors in the data. Um, RA is recording time of day of hormone collection outside the window when appointments could happen, duration in seconds of saliva collection being around 20 minutes. This seems like a major problem for the reproducibility uh, because each researcher is going to have their own choice about how to deal with those inaccurate and plausible data. From a reproducibility standpoint, this seems very problematic. Is there a way we can standardize these kinds of decisions? Like how master sex was checked with salivary sex that doesn't depend on researcher choice? Uh, share your scripts. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So we're still, I mean, I could tell you from being on the, the QC and committees that are responsible for these decisions. I don't, we have, we have toiled with the idea of putting out the raw data and then actually having a second one for each time point of, you know, um, physical health biospecimen data collection, putting out our QC process. But really, for someone to understand how to use that data, you could put it in the readme notes, like the release notes, but it really should be a nice publication talking you through the decision tree. And um, there's so many metrics. I mean, that's, that's we're talking like 15 publications right there. So what we're doing is we're really leaving it out to the individual investigators to publish their decision trees and encourage them to share their scripts um, so that people can go and uh, follow those QC processes. Um, and particularly from authors with internal with ABCD, where we are on the committees, we do have that really intimate knowledge with the metrics. And for us to share scripts, and I think that's a great starting base, and then to welcome people who aren't internal and intimate with the data like that to see how they approach it from the outside is hugely valuable. I mean, both parties are a completely part of this process. And I think it's more meaningful than just us putting out, here's the QC data, that's what you get. So I, yes, it's a problem, but it's not a problem if you annotate like Satra and, and David have brought up and Angie. Thank you. Satra, did you have anything to add or have we belabored this point enough? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, moving on to the next question. This one will be more ABCD specific. Um, and this one goes back to the circadian patterns. So how should circadian patterns in hormone secretion be handled when using ABCD's salivary hormone data? So for anyone who's actually really interested in looking at neuroendocrine function um, and wants to use the hormone data as part of ABCD, you already know the importance of circadian rhythms <laughs> and that collecting them at different times of the day is problematic um, if you're trying to equate them. So you just have to get creative and you have to annotate what you do. So one way is to really narrow in and do your analyses on those who sampled in the morning and then replicate your analysis on those who sampled in the evening. Um, that's one way is to do 
parallels but separate analyses to kind of document that. And so you're basically, when you step back, you're looking at circadian fluctuations across individuals instead of within individuals. So nobody really has done that before. And that's just, you know, something you would do because of how the, how, what data is available to you. So um, the other thing that ABC is really good for is to not look at circadian patterns and to include, instead include, you know, include time of day, either as a covariate or do the parallel analyses chunked by time and really look at it longitudinal as more and more of this, you know, annual, every single year hormone picture, um, you know, is developing across puberty. So instead of diving deep into the lake and looking at what's on the bottom with a circadian pattern and what's on top, you're basically just skipping a stone <laughs> across the lake. And so you just have to be realistic with what you're actually looking at. All right. Thank you. Love the analogy. Um, one more question for you. Uh, can I propose to collect my own biospecimens in ABCD? Okay. So that's a so it's, um, really good question. I put that in there. <laughs> So I'll answer my own question. Um, so yes, we're always um, we're always doing new biospecimens in smaller sub studies that aren't across all the twenty one sites. So there's always the potential, but you're it's a huge ask. It's huge ask because these participants are in a longitudinal ten year study, and we do not we have an attrition thing, you know, factor that we're trying to deal with. We need to make sure that we're not asking too much of them and that we're not taking a biospecimen that's, that's, you know, too invasive or, um, you know, you have to compensate them in some way for certain biospecimens. So my advice would be yes, but it has to be through a site PI. So the proposal has to go through one of the 21 site PIs. So you have to work with one of them and then they can ask if other sites will buy in. And it's up to really each site, you know, principal investigator to determine if their participant, you know, community pool can really take on that extra biospecimen collection. And if their RA team can, you know, take that on at that time. So it's kind of about goodness of fit and bandwidth. Um, the second piece is you might just want to ask around who else is already doing new biospecimen collection and just buddy up with them <laughs> to make sure that, you know, maybe you aren't asking any more of the research teams and the participants because you're being synergistic with someone else who also needs the same blood sample or, you know, whatever it is, hair, nails, anything. Um, the third suggestion is we have biobank samples, right? So once things are um, assayed, we still keep these samples around their biobanks. So you could always go in and use stored samples in the repository rather than doing new collection. So zero additional ask of the research team and the participant pool. Right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch over to a uh, repronym question. And I'm going to try to combine two if I can. Um, so this question reads, given the complexity of neuroimaging data flows, it seems unreasonable for me to evaluate all of the possible effects that changing software and parameters has on my outcome measure. Do you have any advice on how a researcher should practically consider these issues? And then a related question says, uh, if we're encouraged to run so many analytic variants, doesn't that increase our type one error rate uh, finding a result? And how should we reconcile this advice? Great questions. I think there are two parts to it. Uh, the first part, which was about running all the different variants, I think it's for the community to come together, much as we have come together for things like the bid specification. Uh, it's about us coming to what a good workflow or a data flow should be, understanding what the sources of variance are and where they break down. And that's a hard problem. So we're not expecting everybody to necessarily run all the possible variants. That's gonna be computationally intensive, but for at least large data sets like ABCD, we can make available some of them because we can do that at a community level of saying here are different ways of processing this data and understanding those sources of variance. Uh, the second question, which is, if I were to run 100 workflows, uh, the increase of type one error, and I see JB on the call, and he would have a lovely time answering this. So I'm going to punt this straight to JB, who's on the call. <laughs> Thanks, Satra. That's uh, it's sending me the hot potato. <laughs> um, no, uh, uh, that's the great question. So first of all, I think um, before anything, I would like to say, the thing you really want to know is how much viability is actually induced by the pipelines. 
and uh, and 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 the and and, the, and you can't know that unless you have either uh, some sense of what is going on in the literature around this, or or if you actually have run those those things. And it could be on on a subset of the samples if you really have to like you know if it's extremely intensive uh, computationally, you may want to say, hey, I'm going to take those only 300 subjects and see whether we have like a, a big, and and you have ways possibly ways of computing how much how many subjects should I take to. Uh, so that's one thing is you know assessing the uh, uh, and and when we're talking about here here but usually a robustness um, and you know like uh, there's a classic uh, uh, robustness is variation of pipelines replicability is variation of data sets uh, so talking about robustness uh, I think there's no other alternative than just taking uh, you know, as you know, knowledge of the of the domain plus some possible experiment uh, if it's uh, if, if it really is too complex to too hard to uh, and too costly to to run the whole uh, the whole cohort with uh, many pipelines so that's one thing the second thing is the uh, uh, you know uh, multiple comparison issue so I don't think in that setting it is a legitimate to actually do multiple comparison issue what you what you want to describe in your in your publication or, or output is, what is the variation with the pipelines? Uh, and you, it's not really like, and, and then and then it's a it's a judgment call. At, let's say you know like uh, eighty percent of the pipeline gives some result, twenty doesn't, don't you know like. Uh, and then it really is a judgment and uh, and expertise based call on you know whether you 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 are you know, your your result is actually robust enough or uh, with respect to pipeline variation. Uh, and and then you know there's there's all this work of you know why some pipeline are giving you some answer and some pipeline are giving you other answer. That's that's the whole kind of methodological research, uh, and and it's uh, and sometimes it's 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 still unclear, right? Uh, um, so I would I would recommend that first as much as you can, given the limitation of the computation aspect, uh, you assess the variability. Second, uh, that you report that variability. Uh, and 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 take the take the decision, you know, whether you know, your your result is robust enough to be described uh, in that in that context. Thanks, JB. I'm going to just follow up with that. With I know there's going to be a lecture coming up in a few weeks on machine learning. Uh, a perfect example of where different algorithms will have variances in terms of prediction or output, and they may use different kinds of features for different kinds of reasons to produce that output. So it boils down to kind of understanding these computational workflows a little better in looking at where are the sources of variability, where is it making assumptions that don't line up with the data. And this is really something that we've kind of gone away as we use various black box things. So on one hand, a black box that's created by the community or as somebody would say, a glass box that you can look through and introspect you might trust it more because there are many heads that have gone into taking some of those decisions. But it would still be important for you to understand what are the assumptions that people have made in designing that pipeline. Uh, and if that's something that we could, again, annotate alongside these pipelines, we'll get better ideas of where this variability sources lie. Is it in your data? Is it in some step that wasn't created to address those constructs of data? Uh, and this is something we haven't, again, converged on as a community uh, to a place where we can say, take this pipeline, you never have to worry about it. And I'm not sure we will, given the changes in sequences and images that are happening, at least for neuroimaging work. Right, well, thank you. Um, I think there's a related question that just talks more about how we should feel about uh, all of the, all this variability. Uh, so this reads, you bring up a lot of distressing issues present in how we run neural imaging analyses. For example, how running the same analysis across different software yields different results or how different prominent programs make different assumptions about modeling error in the data, leading to different results. Given the fact that there is no ground truth to reference when we do science, this all paints a pretty bleak picture. Do you think you can maybe comment on why we shouldn't be too pessimistic about the state of science? Should I start? Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is part of science. You're exploring things. Um, and so the fact that we have this variability in some ways helps us move forward. Uh, it's part of 
doing the assessment of going through it. It's, I wouldn't call it a, it's a bleak picture in the sense that it's hard to trust some of the things because they haven't looked at exploring a variety of things. They have imposed their hypothesis through the lens of a pipeline. Uh, and I think I would dissociate two things. What we are trying to understand is not the pipeline, although it might be good. It's about that generalizability of some scientific conclusion, how well that holds up across different scenarios. And that typically involves some kind of biological process or other process. And we have to start thinking about modeling that process and improving that model over time. And that would give us, in the absence of ground truth, some ways of ensuring that what we are observing fits with that model. But we often create one model for every observation rather than one model for many observations. And so if we can start bringing models together, that would help us in ways of seeing whether the output is variable from the perspective of the model or variable due to some black box that we use to process the data. Uh, it is a long road. We are not there yet, uh, but I think you have to start thinking of why did you say that this region should show up? Then taking a region that showed up in some statistical analysis and explaining why it, should, why it showed up. And that change is hard, but I think that's if we start going towards how we build up those expectations of our results better, we're going to be in a better place for looking at the variability and perhaps a less bleak picture. So I, yeah, I would like to share a story. So I'm two and a half years into my assistant, you know, um, uh, faculty position. So I wasn't a postdoc that long ago working with neuroimaging data. And when I was sitting in there working with it, um, I was very focused on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And there was this brain, you know, this big consortium that mostly everyone in the field had published what goes on in a brain that's been impacted by alcohol in utero in cross-sectional neuroimaging data. So then I was part of this CFAS, you know, consortium, and I got to, as a postdoc, work with longitudinal data. This is huge for FASD. Now we get to look at brain change, brain development. So I used FreeSurfer, um, you know, um, software, and I had three different time points for most of my participants, but it re still registered each individual to a template or to a part, you know, to a chosen participant at each time point. And guess what? my adolescents with an FASD had lower delayed brain development. So out came the publications, <laughs> you know, prenatal alcohol exposure delays brain development. But then when I used the brand new, new released free surfer longitudinal software <laughs> version, where you actually compare the individuals, each brain scan across the years to the previous scan, and it adds this whole new within subject component. I was the oddball. I found that it actually accelerated brain development. What? A pervasive developmental disability accelerates brain development? Christina, you don't know what you're talking about. And I was totally upset about it. And so uh, Eric Kahn, da data manager for me and and, and uh, uh, for Elizabeth Saul originally, um, he's, he's really, um, he works with Megan Herney as well. So he and I just started getting, you know, having fun with it. And we got excited and curious about it rather than, I mean, definitely that weekend I was very upset, <laughs> but on Monday we got really curious with it. So we just played around. And what we realized is the way in the background of how things were being controlled. Yeah, kids with FASD have reduced brain volumes. So they were always less than controls. And that was artificially producing a profile of delayed brain development. Now we've totally accelerated our understanding because there's rapid brain development when there shouldn't be and then it plateaus at a certain age and then it is lower or stunted brain development later in adolescence into adulthood so those methodological concerns are very devastating whoever put that comment out i feel you i've been there i know <laughs> and just get curious about it you you have to get curious about what's going on behind the scenes you have to pull the curtain up that's a great story thank you for sharing that i hope we take the uh, transcription of that and write it up somewhere that that's very impassioned and true. We will. And, and... Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was a great story. Um, I think I, we are going to switch gears and here's a question from the audience. So the decision to exclude a participant if they test positive on a breathalyzer at the first visit may not exclude all participants who are exposed to substance use. Um, how does that it says, please comment. <laughs> so, uh, it, so 
because the chicken versus the egg was this overarching um, question that um, that the institutes of NIH, you know, really had um, wanted to disentangle. They wanted substance use naive individuals at the entry of baseline. So is the question about that? Why would we make that decision? No, I think it's about being actually under the influence during the protocols. Oh, right. Um, the breathalyzer testing positive. So if you are under the influence of so the breathalyzer test positive, you will just politely <laughs> be told we're going to reschedule. The adolescents told why. They know why, but the parent is not. And that keeps the um, that that confidentiality there. So the parent is just told like, oh, sorry, you know, there's an issue. We're going to just have to reschedule. And it's, you know, hopefully in a close time frame that, you know, you just repeat that visit. But you do ask them to come in again. And the adolescent knows why. So hopefully they will abstain when they come <laughs> the next time. But and then, you know, if we were to tell the parent, now we're an intervention study. Right. So we can't tell the parent that's part of our IRB. We are not allowed to report that. Um, that is not a reportable event. So is, is, does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I think the main point that we want to make to the student is that there is a, a meaningful difference between being under the influence at the time of assessment and being exposed to substance use. Right. So you can have, uh, you know, some amount of use. Um, that we do want to capture that use, but we don't want to do the assessment while you are potentially, um, in this case, drunk, because then your answers will be uh, impacted by that particular state. Right. So it is a unique biospecimen that assesses substance use um, in its kind of in, intents and purposes from the other ones that have a, a, a little bit bigger window of time that we're assessing use. Um, so the breathalyzer really is there to assess that under the influence where we don't really have that ability to do with a lot of other substances. Um, Which I'll also say is also an ethical issue because, um, you know, these child participants, they, they provide assent, not consent, but you can't provide meaningful assent if you are under the influence. That's very interesting. And and if the participant shows up and seems, you know, really high or stoned off other substances, not just alcohol, I mean, RAs are completely um, given the the power to make discretionary calls in real time as well and just talk and just have a real conversation with them. Are you by any chance under the influence? Ah, I forgot I had my appointment. Yes, I did, or whatever. And so again, and that's all withheld from the, the parent. All right, thank you. Uh, there's another question for you. Is transgender status and whether or not they are receiving hormone therapy assessed? What if it, someone is intersex, uh, XXY instead of XX or XY? What about whether or not biological females start taking birth control? I'm curious about how the uh, assays for saliva sampling are treated differently for these cases. Okay, so uh, that was so, such good question. So first of all, I have to, I owe you guys an answer. I have to just confirm, I'm pretty sure we we do assess and have an intersex variable in ABCD. I, I just haven't actually worked with it myself and it's such a good question. So I have to get back with you to confirm that. Um, so yes, absolutely having XX versus XY versus XXY or other variants that exist, um, you know, would, in theory, impact the way that your gonadal hormones are being produced in your body, possibly, unless you had full intact, you know, uh, gonadal organs, it, it may not necessarily, but it would be important to find out. So it's an excellent question. So that's the genetic contribution that would lead to the endocrine production of hormones. The other piece of this question is about transgendered representation. Certainly just just identifying as a gender that doesn't match your genetic sex or not identifying with a gender. I know a lot of these adolescents have a greater proportion of gender neutrality than, you know, previous generations. So, um, you know, that also might be linked or correlated with hormones would be important to assess. And we absolutely have data on transgendered or it's, it's like a scale. Which one do you identify more with? More typical masculine, more typical feminine. Where do you fall on a scale? So you don't have to say one or the other. It's not binary. It's a continuum um, that we do in ABCD. Now, some of those individuals who actually really do have a strong desire to take hormones to make their outward physical appearance look more like the gender they identify with. Absolutely, there are a subset of participants who take 
hormones to make sure that the physical development will align with their their true gender identity that is a mismatch with the biological genetic sex that they were born with so for those individuals we do ask those questions that data is there i haven't looked at a lot of it because honestly we're just kind of pumping out the baseline comprehensive analyses and just no one was taking hormones yet it's just apparently in our country not really an age where someone who's transgendered starts to take hormones at a high prevalence. So we just don't have a lot of it in ABCD. And it's not my area of expertise, but it would be 100% more and more important to, to look at that as you're wor working with salivary hormone data every year, because there's going to be more and more individuals endorsing that context, um, that hormonal exogenous hormonal context. Birth control can also be another uh, source of exogenous hormones. And we absolutely ask birth control questions and um, and kind of what type we try to get at the types so we can get ideas of progesterone based. Is it estradiol, progesterone or what is it? So um, so we do have some birth control. So th those are two sources of exogenous hormones um, that you should absolutely consider. And the other part was what was the last part of that, James? Oops, sorry. That was. Um, <laughs> there was one more I did have it. piece to that question. Sorry, you scroll back up here. Um. And, and, you know, just a kind of a funky thing is that it just for, you know, when, when baseline variables are put out, there's a big hesitancy of NDA to really change it, right, for people who are building off their scripting and their processing, um, you know, uh, systems. Um, just with longitudinal data. So it's just important to know that, you know, biological sex at birth does have a, a label of gender. I think deep portal might might alter that a little bit for you. Um, and then when you give a saliva sample, the RA grabs a tube and the tube color indicates biological sex at birth. So there's a, a space for human air to grab the wrong tube color. Then once they're all shipped in batches back to Cellometrics, the technicians there, they will thaw the sample and assay it and they they really assay all the biological males in one plate and the biological females in another plate and there's not really it's not a huge deal if they're assayed together people do it all the time but just because it's such a huge data set they just kind of separate them by by, by biological sex um and males get two hormones females get three so in salometrics if they have a certain color tube for a certain year, and that tells them it's a biological female, they are gonna rapidly run three assays on that thawed sample, freeze it again to biobank it, whereas the male color tube will only get two. So that's the biggest thing. If you're, if, if you're a participant, you really want, cause you're looking at TBI and you're dwindling down your subsample and you really want their saliva, but ooh, the methodological issue was that they were actually born biological male. They identify as a male gender but they were assayed with the females. Well, now you have estradiol for them. <laughs> it's it's fine. It really is fine. You can use their DHEA and testosterone. Um, but it, it is a little bit different. You want to make sure that they're not an outlier. Um, so, yeah. All right, thank you. I think, and did you already mention intersex? Um, yeah, so I need yeah. to check. I need to get back okay, with yeah. you guys and add that to the public notes okay. about what that variable looks like in ABCD. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Uh, and I think there's just one more on the follow-up for the breathalyzer question that was asked earlier. Um, so do you expect at baseline some participants were already exposed to substance use? So, um, yeah, so we're really just talking about alcohol here um, in real time. So, yeah, there's a possibility that, they, that we have some participants that maybe aren't truly um, substance naive, but we ask them to. So they would have to say no right? Um, they would have to not come in currently with a positive breathalyzer um, test. Um, but I can tell you at age nine and 10, a lot, that wasn't really an issue. We didn't, we weren't ex turning around a lot of people, I, maybe a couple, maybe, <laughs> like most of them that just, even though it's there as a clear exclusionary criteria, we didn't really have to like um, execute it very, or, sorry, that's the wrong word. We didn't have to act on, you know, positive breathalyzers 
at baseline to then say, sorry, but we actually can't have you in this cohort. I do think it probably did happen once or twice, but that's it across all the sites. Um, and of course that doesn't include all the other substances. So, um, you know, that's why we just did a sub sample of participants just to kind of confirm like these kids are drug naive and, and when we ask them and they say they're substance use naive, you know, um, this is real. It's important for you guys to know that when you have a nine or 10 year old that doesn't know what cocaine is or marijuana or, or nicotine or, or tobacco, just by asking them, have you ever used cocaine? You are actually influencing their familiarity with that term. And in turn, it's possible it may, the more familiar they become with it, the more they're likely to look at the group who was talking about cocaine and go talk to those kids, right? So that's an intervention. So we actually are, are very careful to really ask beginner teaser questions kind of to get a sense if the kid even knows anything. Be, so we're not the ones being the first people to tell them about these drugs. So um, so we have some kind of beginner questions that we ask just to get a sense if they might know what we're talking about. Thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna switch over to some referendum questions now. Um, here are a couple of questions that are very related to each other. So Satra, are there any examples you can speak to about how we can build and do automated testing into our ABCD analyses? And perhaps a related question, can you give us an example of a validated workflow? And I'd love to know more about how we can uh, validate our own workflows. So that second question is a really tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, validation has many, many lenses through one which one can look at it. Uh, I would say to a large extent, some of the workflows like FreeSurfer, fMRI prep, the HCP pipelines have gone through a fair bit of internal validation in the sense that they work as expected on a bunch of data sets that have been looked at. Uh, uh, FreeSurfer in particular has an internal data set that it gets tested on that results don't change. So this brings, us, brings me back to the first question, which is about how you might be able to test uh, your analysis on different things. So first thing about testing is you have to agree on what a test is. Uh, and so there are a few ways of thinking about it, which is, is my result consistent if I take subgroups of the ABCD data? Now that brings about a whole other question on how do you take subgroups of ABCD data, which I'm going to put aside for the moment. Uh, but that would be one way of saying, if my results are consistent, that's one way of saying that my workflow is consistent. Uh, another thing is to take the workflows themselves without the ABCD data and coming up with very specific scenarios that you think could alter the outputs of that workflow. And this ideally should be done by the workflow developers at some level uh, where they understand where the workflow breaks down or how they're expanding the workflow. So as an example, the fMRI prep pipeline has been designed to deal with many different diverse sources of data. And it didn't start off with that aspect at the start. They went in and kept expanding the range of data sets that they could analyze uh, and look at the details of that data set. So that's another way of looking at kind of testing your workflow. Now, let's say you don't have a workflow. You have your analysis script. Uh, how would you test that analysis script? Uh, so you could run. Uh, that analysis script through some of the tools Repronym has built, Test Kraken is one of them, which allows you to run the same analysis script in different environments and see if those environments change. Uh, you could, if your analysis script use something like NiPipe, you could swap out an algorithm from let's say FSL to an algorithm from SPM or AFNI and see how that impacts your results. Uh, these and you can test it against a regression test on your output since you don't have ground truth data. You can say, how far did that change change my results? Uh, now, this is a little tedious, but this is why we recommend that you don't create analysis scripts by yourself, except for educational purposes, of things that have been well modeled by the community. So you reuse those things that already brings in better use of consistent workflows. Uh, I always think it's a great exercise for any grad student or postdoc who's getting into neuroimaging analysis to write their own thing, uh, to try and learn about how this thing actually 
works. But if you start looking at the details of fMRI prep, you realize how much knowledge that has been built up in the community over the years goes into designing a robust script. Uh, and that's important. So I would separate this out as validated workflows that are coming from community knowledge aggregation and you ha have you trusting those and reporting bugs as they come across your data set. They haven't been tested for every single scenario. And the second component for your own scripts, which could be statistical analysis scripts, they don't have to be full workflows, where you try and see what the impact of, oh, if I randomly leave out half the data, especially for a data set like ABCD, I may not expect a huge change in the output. And that would be another way of thinking about the robustness of your scripts or in our terms, replication, because you're changing the data. <laughs> All right, thank you. That was a great answer. Uh, I think this question, it says this for Christina, but you might both might be able to say something a little bit about it. Um, can you talk a little about some potential ways to integrate biospecimen data into neuroimaging analyses? I'm interested in doing this and know I need to read more papers on this, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about the basics of doing so. It's such a, it's such a fun question. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's kind of also fun to remember that biospecimens in general are really ramping up in our ability to do even more and more with less and less. So you can connect all of those across um, the same individual. And then with neuroimaging, I mean, we're still, we're just constantly changing and evolving every year. So there's still relatively new areas. So I would say there's no general particular, this is exactly how you do it. I think I am I would like to invite you to be innovative in it. You know, uh, people sometimes just look at associations between brain and biomarkers. Sometimes people um, will, you know, do kind of more correlational plots or like a, a group factor analysis to see how they all kind of either increase or decrease together while controlling for each other and which one, you know, contributes unique variants. So if your brain volume is a certain size and you have this much hormone, um, you know, with this genetic <laughs> uh, genotype background, um, you know, what's the increment uh, for every increase in, in millimeters cube for this, you know, blood-based biomarker, you know, what kind of, how do those correlate together? Um, I think people do it in different ways and sometimes they'll subset the analyses by a biomarker and look at differences in brains. But most of what I've seen out there is associations, correlations, right? Just kind of, you know, when one changes up, you know, does the other one go up or is it down? And then looking at that as a context of, you know, sex or a mental health um, factor or environmental factor that you're looking at. So that's most of what people do. Um, but I personally, someone asked a question about type one errors, and I, I definitely consider my preliminary methodological or even my outcome measures, you know, those big giant correlation matrices, I don't ever include those in my type one errors. It, maybe I should be, <laughs> but that's, I just, that's me looking at my data, right? It's just saying, you know, are these correlated? Are these, you know, connected? Are the methods of collecting these, the scanner type related to my hormone levels? Cause that shouldn't matter. It's just a check and balances. So, I mean, you got to visualize your data, um, you know, definitely get your a priori hypotheses maybe written out before you do that. But um, so I think it's good to do, you can, I mean, a correlation matrix or, or looking at associations is meaningful. Um, you know, Mary Bell Gonzalez and Megan Hurdy and I in the puberty one, you know, did group factor analysis because we were acknowledging that people have been looking at uh, puberty in very specific groups. They're looking at, you know, young adolescents who identify as Asian American only or young adolescents who identify as Caucasian or African American. And there wasn't a lot of diversity in the same study. Well, ABCD, we actually can do that. So how do you consider things like race, ethnicity, or income, or parental education, all these are, you know, um, environmental factors that we really strongly suspect show up in puberty and would be reflected in pubertal hormones, which then go and make your brain more mature. So all those things matter. So we did group factor analysis, and that was one way to just throw it all in there, right? So I would say, you know, buddy up with someone who has a really good statistical model to kind of, you know, tease these things apart. And if that statistical model hasn't been applied to that particular brain and biospecimen marker together ever before, super exciting. So, um, yeah. 
a new statistical me method brings this whole new, you know, unveils this whole new aspect, really. Right, thank you. Um, Satya, did you want to add anything? Or, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And I have another question for you, Christina. Uh, I've noticed that some ABCD participants decrease in their PDS scores such that they report being in a less advanced stage of puberty at year one or year two relative to baseline. Some proportion of this may be due to error or bias in self-report, but the number of participants that decrease is significant. They cite more than uh, 1,000 participants have uh, reported this. What do you think of this and how would you suggest handling those data? Is it logical to omit participants or time points that don't seem biologically plausible? Or is pubertal regression an acceptable, uh, sufficient explanation of this? Yeah, okay, so welcome to, uh, come join my conversations with Megan Herding, one of the site MPIs too at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Yes, so we see this in all sorts of studies. This is not novel or new to ABCD. So when you, it's a, there's a huge difference if you're looking at parental report versus adolescent self-report. So the parents are actually much, much better at estimating actual physical pubertal maturation <laughs> um, because they know what adults look like. And so they're better at estimating it. So we have two uh, Peterson development scales. One's the parent and one is the adolescent self-reporting. So I would say early on, we know that parent report is uh, um, more reliable and that you, you know that because it goes up as we would expect it. What we think happens in childhood when they would enter, be at an age where they'd enter ABCD between nine and 10 years old, is that, you know, they have that one little change and that's a really big deal to them. So they go and mark the next stage, but they're not actually fully really changing yet from an adult perspective. <laughs> so you, so then, you know, the next year, then the real changes happen. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm definitely in category two now, but they reported three last year because something happened. <laughs> so it's, it's really messy um, from the child's perspective. Now, as an individual actually becomes more and more mature and closer to the adult phenotype physically, there's an element of privacy that they usually start, um, you know, um, enforcing themselves. And so now the adolescent report could very as could very well become more reliable than the adult parent report. So these are, you know, this is why the physician report is the gold standard, but we don't do that in ABCD. Um, so it is something that is there with data, how to handle it. I would say, be careful if you're using parent or, or child adolescent report and that might change as you go forward. And in the Herding in Ubin 2021 that's coming out next week, um, Frontiers and Echnology, um, that will kind of touch on that a little bit. And then uh, Teresa Chin is uh, first authoring a commentary from independent puberty experts um, on our publication that should be coming out end of February. So that's C-H-E-N-G, uh, first name's Teresa, and, and they're gonna, as an independent outsider of ABCD telling, you know, how do you handle these issues with salivary collection, with pubertal report going up or down? You know, what do we really do with ABCD from people who are not part of ABCD from an independent view? So um, I would say look for that um, coming out too. Thank you. Well, and everyone's sharing scripts. <laughs> of course. Uh, I think I'd like to see if we can squeeze in one more question from a participant that just entered the question. Uh, it says, how would uh, IC analysis be useful in future clinical research where individual variables slash endpoints over ICs are usually targeted by interventions? And actually they just posted a revised question. How would I see analysis be useful in future clinical research for individual variables and points over ICs are usually targeted by interventions? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mixing clinical and mechanistic research, but clinical work usually relies on mechanistic research. So Christina, gotcha. do you have anything to say? Uh, so, um... So I think it's a hugely important for clinical <laughs> research. I mean, we don't, it's the sample size to me that is huge, right? So um, because it, it represents more uh, diversity of participants, because we have such a large sample, it's multiple geographical locations and we are collecting data in a very, very coordinated way. I think you can start getting estimates of maybe clinical standards, clinical norms of, of different things that we're doing in ABCD that could, you know, have 
immediate potential to help inform, you know, clinical standards, or at least the, the development of clinical standards. So it wouldn't go right into a doctor's office and they would put their, part, their patient on a chart right away from our ABCD findings. But I think there's only really one more step to just kind of really validate that. So I think when you use the whole sample and you report these things in a very meaningful way and you include all the sociodemographics in a very productive way, um, I think that these huge sample sizes can help us really rapidly go and, and have meaningful results to inform, inform uh, like pediatrician practices. Is that what's the question? Okay. I, I believe so. Uh, and okay. we've run out of time. Yes. So that was great. The end, but thank you. Can thank I you so much. also make a mark that um, uh, Hawa and Vita have looked and, and there are variables in the um, salivary sex, you know, what, uh, what sex were you born at uh, your original birth certificate? And also there's a variable PDS underscore sex underscore Y um, that's really asking, what do you consider yourself male or female? But we are not finding an intersex variable at this point. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, I wanna thank everybody here, our TAs, Dr. Yubin, Dr. Ghosh for um, providing their lectures this week and, and answering our questions. Um, we did have a couple of questions that were left unanswered. We're going to make sure that we get those written out and posted to all the students so that we get everyone's questions. Um, but with that, we will draw this session to a close. Thanks, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you for next week. All right, thanks, Thank everybody. You Thank you so much.